All right, I think we can uh, get started now. So, a teacher, an economist, and a developer, they walk into a bar and they take a seat, and they immediately start debating on who has the easiest job. The economist turns to the teacher, you obviously have the easiest job. You play with kids all day and get the summers off. The teacher, looking rightly offended, disagrees. There's no way I have the easiest job. Clearly, economists have the easiest job. You just pull predictions out of thin air and it doesn't even matter if they are wrong. The economist takes a deep breath as if about to launch into a rebuttal, but instead just looks at the developer. What? cries the developer. Don't look at me. Why, just today I wrote a bunch of code, fully unit tested. Then I had a planning meeting for the next program increment. Have you ever heard of that? That's basically predicting the future and management take it way too seriously. So I work all summer and forced to predict the future and then get the blame when I'm wrong. Yeah, says the economist. But your office has a ping pong table, right? So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for choosing to attend my session. Uh, my name is Adele and I'm a software engineer at Trifork Amsterdam. And when I say thanks, I do really mean that. <laughs> With Dylan, speak, Biddy, Dylan Beattie sorry, speaking in the next room, um, it's really amazing that you're all here. So thank you so much for that. So there's no doubt that software professionals, we have a really uniquely demanding job. And it goes so far beyond what the average computer science degree teaches us. There are all of these other activities that we are expected to participate in in order to do our jobs well. So just quickly, I'll put my sun visor on. Uh, who in this room has a computer science degree? OK, a lot of you, but not everybody. So I can assume the people with their hands down don't have a computer science degree. Is that a correct assumption? Or Great. Uh, so I do see some nods, and that is excellent that I am not the only one. So we have a bit of variety in the audience, and this is what I really love to see. So my study background is in civil engineering and economics, and I've also spent some time working in marketing and sales. These experiences from different areas is where the idea for this talk came from. I just found myself thinking a little bit differently than my colleagues, especially in my early days as a developer. Now, of course, I had mega imposter syndrome days, and I still do, but I learned pretty quickly to leverage what I did know rather than beating myself up for not knowing what others knew. So that's where the idea for this talk came from. It's a bit of my, a mix of my personal experience and interests, as well as uh, some professions that I wanted to learn a little bit more about. And I'm going to share these findings with you through storytelling because conference life is hard and it's the last session of the day and your brains can only take so much fact dumping at once. So sit back and relax in your movie theater th uh, chairs and uh, hopefully you learn something. So the stories we're about to hear center around a team some issues they face and how they work through them. And the team is loosely based on my team at Trifork, only the names, characters, locations and events are different. So in the newly formed team, we have the tech lead Malcolm, the project manager RJ and some devs. And being a project-based consultancy, the PO and domain expert uh, is the main contact at the customer. And the team has been assembled to, uh, to improve the relationship with the customer and transition away from being a feature factory to being a true technology partner. And the team has inherited a large and aging Java project. The project could be described as somewhat less than joyful to work on. Most of the devs on the team are far from excited for this project to represent their current reality. Immediately, one of the devs feels overwhelmed and starts complaining to Malcolm, one of the most patient and level-headed people you could ever meet. Malcolm, exclaims junior dev leaker, it's taken me three days to set up my environment just to work on this project. The main applications are finally building, but it takes over 15 minutes. The code base is hard to navigate, technical debt is off the charts, and the documentation sucks. 
How on earth are we supposed to work like this? We need to start rebuilding this ASAP and move out from the 2010s and into the 2020s. Malcolm responds calmly. Lika, you're right. This is a tough project. And clearly the priorities of the previous team are not the same as ours. Let's spend some time pairing and promote this practice within the team. This should help us optimise our workflow and we can create tickets as we go. Although Malcolm had helped Lika's anxiety levels to drop, she just was not convinced of the approach. The only way out she can see is a rewrite. Over lunch, she brings up the topic with RJ. RJ listens intently. By the time Lika has finished monologuing, RJ's lunch is gone, while Lika's has barely been touched. Lika, he says, have you heard of opportunity cost? Lika shakes her head. Opportunity costs occur whenever there is a trade-off between two options. It's the cost of the options or opportunities that you give up when you make a decision in terms of goods and services. Ah, uh, what? Lika looks as lost as a back-end developer at a UX conference. So let's think about what you're proposing. It looks like we have two options. We can keep working on this old project, accepting lower developer joy and velocity for the foreseeable period, or rewrite the damn thing. Do you agree? Yes, replies Lika. Okay, so what do you think it would cost to rebuild the worst parts of the project? So the core service and the reporting service. Lika goes into full estimation mode. So a rough estimate, it would take three developers 12 months, let's call it 21 hours, based on my rates, 200k, but we probably need some dev time, so let's make it 250k. Okay, 250k, says RJ. Is that everything? Yep, replies Lika. Oh, and I guess we'd have to convince the customer that it's a good idea. Okay, replies RJ. Now, let me ask you, given the current velocity of the team, what's the value to the customer of the features that three developers could deliver in 12 months? Lika shrugs her shoulders. I have no idea. It would be much more than 250K, replies RJ. Ah, replies, uh, replies Lika. She sees where RJ is coming from. But wait, she says, surely our faster velocity after the rebuild will make up for it. Okay, how much faster do you think we'll be after the rebuild? We can double our velocity, says Lika confidently. RJ starts scribbling on a napkin. He's like, so assuming your estimate is accurate, we produce nothing for one year, then twice as much the next year as the year before the rewrite. Yes. And so then at the end of year two we are at the same position as where we started. And at the end of year three, we have done 1.3 times the work we otherwise would have. And end of year four, 1.5 times. Now, that's assuming that the velocity of the rebuild doesn't drop at all. Lika starts to see RJ's point. RJ continues, I've worked with Malcolm for a very long time. I know what we can do with the right team. There is no way that we will finish the year with the same velocity that we have now. We can do this. So this is a admittedly a very simple explanation of opportunity cost, but in this case, it was all RJ needed to get buy-in from Lika. And we can summarise it as the cost to do the thing plus the cost of not doing a different thing. So let's explore this a little further and go through some choices we might encounter as developers and the factors we need to consider as it relates to opportunity cost. So with Lika and RJ, we saw the rewrite versus improve decision. And here are some others. So with respect to internal tooling libraries and frameworks, we have the direct cost to build, run and maintain, for example, salaries and, and hosting or cloud expenses. And 
But what about other costs, like the learning curve for new developers or the willingness of those developers to work at a company that has custom internal tooling? Because it's not just the company that assumes the cost. The employee has a cost as well. It could result in what I call junk professional development. And that's learning with low transference to future positions. So for example, learning a custom framework rather than something like Spring or .NET. We also have the choice between custom or SaaS. So has anyone here heard of Wardley mapping? I heard one yes. OK. So he has this brilliant method of mapping the drivers of uh, value along a continuum from brand new to commodity. And the more of a commodity something is, the better it is to buy or rent than to build yourself. Now, computing used to be a value add, for example, but now essentially it's a commodity. And essentially, it boils down to, is the thing we want to build, is that our core business, our competitive advantage, the thing that separates us from the competition? And if the answer is no, then you just need to reach for the ass. And that, by the way, is the only time you should reach for the ass after hearing no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, build versus buy is it? <laughs> I'm glad someone liked it. Uh, should I wait? All right. So build versus buy this is, is a discussion that we often have with our customers and potential customers at Trifork. We build custom enterprise solutions. So the discussion of why should we build or hire you, uh, sorry, why should we hire you or buy off the shelf, that comes up a lot. And so guiding them through this is basically a question of, is this your core business? And we do this not only to keep the customer happy and to keep our integrity intact, um, but because also we just don't want to build something that already exists. So next up, we have learning and development. Now, the opportunity cost of becoming an expert is reducing the number of areas where you know things. And on the flip side, the opportunity cost of knowing a little about a lot is be being an expert in one area or having a high level of expertise in one area. And meetings, as we know all too well, also have an opportunity cost. Uh, because the cost of keeping everybody on the same page is interrupting employee workflow. And in the case of maintenance versus development is the classic example of taking on tech debt to go fast now, accepting a poorer implementation and a higher chance of bugs to get software in the hands of users now. So, Let's rejoin RJ, Malcolm, and Lika, but not from where we left them. Uh, we're going to join them in an alternate reality, one where RJ doesn't understand opportunity cost and Lika gets her way. So the team decides to rewrite the core service and the reporting service, and this is going to be a big bang replacement. The customer agrees that the rewrite is the best move, however, a year is far too long and they set a hard deadline of three months. So with classical mythical man month logic, RJ throws 12 developers on the project and this is how you know that it's an alternate reality because RJ just happens to have a spare 12 developers to throw on a project at a moment's notice. Although maybe in the last year we've moved a little bit closer to this reality. Anyway, other than the oversupply of developers uh, and Lika getting away, this reality is the same as the previous one or the original one. So what happens is really predictable. So the end of month, month three rolls around, nothing's been delivered. Despite this, the team are heavily invested in the project and they ask for more time and resources. RJ doesn't want to look like a fool and neither does the customer. So not only is the project extended for another three months, another six developers are added. And at the end of those three months, the project is still not complete. 
However, the commitment of the original project sponsors remains as strong as ever. Developers are complaining about rework and changing unclear requirements, but it's totally fine. We're just in the reality where we can just, you know, get developers very easily. Besides, they've come this far and it would just be a waste to abandon all the work that they have already done. So, sure enough, project gets extended for another six months. Finally, at month 10 of the now 12-month project, the board gets involved and they are livid. This project is costing five times the original estimate and taking four times as long. How on this alternate earth did we get here? So can anyone help the board out? Does anyone have any ideas of the phenomenon that's happening here? No? All right. So it's the sunk cost fallacy. So the sunk cost fallacy is the tendency to continue an endeavour once an investment in money, effort or time has been made. In other words, the tendency to throw good money after bad. At month three and month six, there are signs that the project is doomed. The most rational thing to do would be to shut down the project. The money already spent is a sunk cost. No way to recover it. But giving up would feel like a waste. So RJ and the team press on. At the beginning of a project or when deciding on the best approach, we are less emotionally attached to any particular course of action. It's easier to think through the consequences or opportunity costs of our decisions. But as more work is done, emotional attachment on the project tends to increase and we let those emotions get in the way of our decision making. And this leads us to devote resources to a failing course of action. So, in management and psychology, they use the term escalation of commitment to describe this. And if I'm honest, even though I come from an economics background, I actually prefer the term escalation of commitment and the reasoning around it. So, research, sorry, research shows that economics uh, awareness and study of the sunk cost fallacy uh, as a concept doesn't actually improve our ability to cut our losses and move on. However, when we accept that we are flawed humans with emotional brains and we make a habit of questioning our decisions, then we can actually take steps to make more balanced decisions. And if you look at any large and expensive failure, whether that's software development, war, business going under, you will often find an escalation of commitment. So let's go for a change of scenery. Let's shift from the conference room to the weight room, to the gym. So about two years ago, I started a weight loss journey, again. And I like to blame the pandemic and the lack of activity related to that uh, for my weight gain. But in reality, I'd been making poor choices for longer than that. Uh, I tried and failed to regain control by seeking you know, exercise perfection, or my definition of it anyway. And it would work for a few weeks, but before long I'd have a moment of weakness and I'd break my food and exercise rules and I'd give up. So eventually I decided that enough was enough and that I needed help. So I hired a personal trainer and coach. Now, what do you think, think the first thing we started working on was? Now, I'm gonna get my sun visor out. So hands up if you think diet. One up the back, all right, a few. Cool. Lifting technique. All right, couple. And exercises that burn the most calories. All right, so those of you that kept trans down, you're actually right because it was none of these. <laughs> uh, although the honorable mention does go to diet. Diet was the second lesson. Uh, but the first lesson was around habits specifically forging good habits rather than striving for a perfect result. Consistency over perfection. So any trainer or coach that is worth hiring understands this concept at a fundamental level and they live by it. And not every workout is a perfect workout. Not every meal is a perfect meal. 
Striving for that will just burn you out and increase the chances that you will give up and revert to your old habits. So consistency over perfection, Adele, very nice point. But what does that mean in the context of software development? Well, actually, we can see this in the principles behind the Agile Manifesto. So hands up if you've actually read the Agile Manifesto. All right, we have, we have some teacher's pets in class, great. Okay, now, uh, so those of you who haven't, do you think it mentions the word scrum? Oh, the, the people that have read it are giving it away. <laughs> uh, so, uh, in lifting, so many people do believe that Scrum is listed in the Agile, Manifest, uh, and Agile, Manifest, yeah, <laughs> Agile Manifesto. Agile um, Manifesto. And we call that, in lifting, we refer to that as like bro science. So... That's where stories get passed around the gym, usually like the best way to make gains. And it becomes kind of like a folklore, which doesn't really capture the essence of the original idea. But once it gets accepted as truth, it's very, very hard to change people's minds. So in my brain, Scrum is like agile bro science. And there are two principles in the Agile Manifesto that I'd actually like uh, to remind you of, or show you for the first time. Uh, there's absolutely zero shame in that, by the way. That's why we come to conferences, right? To learn. So the first principle that I'd like to share is our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And the second is deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with the preference for the shorter time scale. Consistency over perfection. So consistency is working software in users' hands as quickly as possible. Respond to feedback with small changes, repeat. Perfection. The pursuit of perfection can lead us further away from our goals, to situations of scope creep, over-engineering, or designing for a future that never comes. You know, some of the worst culprits of this are premature scalability or greenfield microservices when you only have a team of six. Or embarking on a rewrite simply to scratch your nerd itch of working with the latest technologies. But by being persistent and uh, consistent, sorry, with good habits, finding something enjoyable in the process, you can achieve much more than you think. So in the words of Agile Manifesto signer Kent Beck, I'm not a great programmer. I'm just a good programmer with great habits. Some of you might disagree with Kent's humble self-assessment, but whether you agree or not, the message is worth listening to. Our success or lack thereof is a product of our habits, which then leaves the question, how do we form great habits? Uh, anyone who's tried to make a lifestyle change can tell you that it is hard, but striving for consistency over perfection can take you a hell of a long way. So we're going to go back to RJ, Lika and the team and we're going to go into their original reality. The one where Lika thankfully doesn't get her way and the team decide to improve what they've got rather than doing a rewrite. And the one where Malcolm is the world's most jacked tech lead. He's also read the book Atomic Habits by James Clear, an MIT researcher. So let's go back to the first conversation that Malcolm and Lika had. What were the biggest grievances that Lika had with the project? Slow build, tech debt, sucky documentation. The day after this conversation, Malcolm and Lika sit down and analyze the project together. They review the Sonicube output, which they use as a measure of technical debt. They get the following output on the core service. 97 bugs, seven vulnerabilities, and 1987 code smells. See, take that off the charts. How do we even begin? Lika is clearly overwhelmed. Unfazed, Malcolm replies, by taking small steps. Malcolm calls the rest of the team over and takes them through 
the habit forming template that his PT used with him when he decided to get jacked. So step one, start small and be specific. The easiest way to do this is to add a small behavior with a measurable outcome to an existing behavior. What's something that we do regularly that we could build a helpful habit into? In the case of Malcolm and the team, they decide that every merge request or completed user story will remove at least five code smells and one, or one bug. Step two is to find joy in the process, or at the very least, try to find a way to make the pro process more tolerable. So many housekeeping type goals like reducing tech debt are not glamorous, they're, they're even pure tedium. Uh, but it's important you find something that works for you. For example, I find that embedding the housekeeping work in a feature ticket, the way the team are doing here, that's enough for me. I like to know that I left things better than when I found it. And that applies to code that I review as well. Another one that I like is if I can add a feature with a net reduction in lines of code. Uh, but reward and joy can be other things like going for a walk or taking a ping pong break between tedious tasks. Like whatever works for you, just figure it out. The next and most possibly important step is recognizing that you will slip up occasionally. That is normal, you are a human. The key point is that you get back on track quickly. So for example, you find yourself in a rush at the end of the sprint and you kind of just jam the feature in. It's okay, just simply pick up the thread on the next story. And this is the caveat, this, this is the kicker. You have to make sure that you do pick up the thread because if you slip twice, the habit is less likely to stick and you risk ending up with a code base full of band-aids and duct tapes. So when you recall this talk, you said, oh, she said just jam the feature. Yep, big but, big condition. And step four, it's not really a step, it's more of a reminder. It's important to be patient and honest with yourself and also with each other. So it might be that you enter a period where bugs or smells are going up again. You can discuss what's happening with your team in the retro and you can make a plan. In my team, we've actually had times where we realize we are short on data to, to take the best path forward, which is when we will talk about ways to improve this. So at different times, we've added extra logging, we've updated our dashboards, we've created extra load test scenarios, we've compared how many bugs have found their way into acceptance and production in the current period versus the last. Even actions like knowledge sharing sessions have helped so that the more people that know about the complex and error prone part of the app, uh, so that more people know how the more complex and error prone parts of the app work. Uh, this also just means that people with different experience and insights can also um, provide ideas on the issues that are being seen. So also important to appreciate that not every hiccup will require a change of plan. So what's needed could actually just be simply adhering to the current plan a little bit better, which is why it's really, really important for your retros to be a safe space, like free from blame, but with space for accountability. So you can be truthful about where things are going wrong and take steps to make things better, rather than trying to push the problem outwards. So, for example, by blaming another team, indecisive stakeholders, or burdensome business processes. Lastly, it's important to reflect on your progress, to see how far you've come and to reward yourself. So, for example, how much has the quality report improved in the last six months? Is velocity starting to increase, if only a little? Is the code review process faster and more effective? Is the project simply more joyful to work on? Set a date and evaluate your progress. In the meantime, you can think up some reward ideas. And our team, we like to celebrate our milestones, even the maintenance ones. So getting all our customers to the newest version of the product or migrating the database to reduce our tech stack.
So when I first came up with the idea for this talk, I naturally thought of the professions where I had experience or where people close to me have experience. You know, I didn't want to give you a talk that could have been a Google search or a response from ChatGPT. And I actually come from a long line of teachers. There are about 25 of them in my extended family. Yes, my extended Catholic family. Uh, my grandmother was one of 12 and my mother was one of seven. So with that field to play in, I was sure I'd uncover some great conventional teaching wisdom. I was so confident I even put it in the title on the CFP. I thought the insight would be something along the lines of every child is unique, which would map very nicely to every project is unique or every team is unique. But as I got to work and started collecting everybody's input, I found myself actually getting pushed in a different direction. Overwhelmingly, the following theme came up, relationships first. Now, call me oblivious, but this isn't really the thing I think of when I think of teachers, overworked, underpaid, underappreciated, spring to mind. Uh, but when I really thought about it, I realized that even though my family's huge, my mom still has updates for me every time I call her. Cousin Barry's up to this, cousin Yoli's up to that. They even have a family reunion every few years. Family members flying in from all over Australia simply to catch up with each other. And this is like a properly organised event with like invitations, venue, catering, there's even entertainment. I mean, they're the entertainment, but still. I'm convinced that at least part of the reason they stay so connected is because of all the teachers actively making an effort to keep everyone in the loop. A living, breathing example of relationships first. Successful teachers maintain a web of relationships with people who all have different needs. The rationale being that if you can't connect with them, then you can't teach them. And this extends far beyond the student. For example, to the student's families, their other teachers, school administrators, education department, list goes on. So it becomes, if you can't connect with them, then you can't rely on them, ask a favour of them, do your best work with them, trust them, take risks with them. So put your hand up if you're an extrovert. We have a couple. I know it's a dev conference. It's going to be not that many. That's fine. Um, so, yeah, not too many hands. And believe it or not, despite the fact that I am on this stage, I'm actually an introvert. <laughs> Building relationships does not come naturally to me. I have to make a conscious effort and I don't always get it right. Uh, for example, it can sometimes take me months before I have a proper conversation with the new starters at my job. And that's like only one to two people a month in a company of like 40. But somehow I just always have a backlog. And to let you in on a little secret, one of the reasons I like speaking at conferences is because it gives people an excuse to come up and talk to me. This means I don't have to awkwardly initiate the conversation because it would be awkward. And yes, that is a shameless request for you to come up and say hello if you see me over the next few days. So one day at lunch, Lika is chatting with the developer from another project, Yoast. And even though they see each other nearly every day in passing, this is the first time they've had a proper conversation. They start discussing their projects and it doesn't take long until Yoast starts complaining that his project needs a rewrite. Lika can't help but let out a little giggle. What are you laughing at? Says Yoast, feeling a little judged. I'm sorry, Yost. It's just that you sound exactly like me from a few months ago when I joined my current team. What we decided to do instead was work at consistently reducing our tech debt. At first, it seemed really overwhelming, but we've actually made some really good progress. Yost is intrigued. Deep down, he knows a rewrite would probably fail. He's just really frustrated. Would you mind sharing your approach with my team? Actually, you know what? Like, I know that some of the other teams are having issues uh, caused by tech debt and they'd love some tips on how to reduce it. Would you be open to running a lunchtime session for us? Lika looks hesitant. Look, it doesn't have to be too formal, reassures yours. Just give a lightning talk and then we can just break up into smaller discussion groups. 
Plus, he added, I know you're a big introvert just like me. This would be a nice way to get to know more people at the company. I'm sick of having to make awkward conversation at the coffee machine. I have nothing left to say about the weather. The next week, Lika and Yost run the session. Lika's presentation goes well, kickstarts some really great conversations. One of the attendees mentions that in addition to Sonicube, they are making use of a couple of helpful plugins. Now, Lika's head is now full of ideas which she takes back to her team to implement. And within a week, one of the session attendees approaches Lika to ask about how they could run their own session. Lika and Yost have started something good. What Lika and Yost have set in motion is the formation of communities of practice or guilds. This is where members with a common interest interact regularly to share information, improve their skills and actively work on advancing the, advancing the general knowledge of the domain of interest. So community of practice are organic, self-directed and they're a great example of putting relationships first, just like my family reunions. However, unlike my family reunions, the entertainment features robust conversation rather than Uncle Fred's robust share impersonation. So several months have passed and the team has made some good progress in reducing their tech debt. Malcolm brings a small gift for each member of the team. More importantly, especially for Lika, is that working on the project is becoming more joyful every day. The team are in the middle of opening their gifts when RJ notices the dashboard on the big screen. What's happening here? He wonders out loud. The team stop what they are doing and they huddle around the dashboard. The disc of one of the core service machines is nearly full. Malcolm takes a closer look at the machine. The culprit is a very large and expanding log file. Lika opens up the client for the message broker. One of the queues seems to be blocked. It has a large number of messages in the queue and the number is growing. Overall response times in the app are still okay and only a small number of users are impacted and the team wants to keep it this way. Marta, one of the team's devs, draws four columns on the whiteboard and labels them A, N, C, A. A, N, C, A is a concept that Marta picked up while completing her private pilot's license. It resonated with her so much that she introduced it to the team. And after some discussion about its merits and applicability, the team decided to use it as their framework for dealing with production issues. Aviate, navigate, communicate, administrate. Aviate. In other words, fly the aircraft first. When there are competing priorities in the cockpit, it's all too easy to become fixated on one particular issue. For example, a specific alarm, instruction or warning. Aviate reminds the pilots of their number one priority, which is to keep the damn plane in the air. Navigate. So the plane is still in the air. The passengers are delightfully unaware that the, that the pilots aren't just, you know, sipping coffee and reading the newspaper. So what is your current position and where are you going? Can you verify visually where you are? Is the original destination airport still the best option of uh, where to go, given how you're going right now? Stay on course until you and your co-pilot decide on a course of action. Oh yeah, and keep flying the plane. Communicate. Should you alert air traffic control about what is happening? What about the cabin crew? Be clear with communication in the cockpit. Acknowledge your co-pilot and repeat back any decisions made so that they can confirm. Administrate. This is a newer addition to the model and it's often overlooked. Uh, it's the tasks that enable you to do the other tasks well uh, and may inform your decision. So in the cockpit, that could mean calculating the estimated time of arrival or how much fuel is remaining. And after a safe landing, it could co include logging and an incident report. So back at the whiteboard, the team considered a first column, aviate. In software development, this could mean two main things. 
If you're taking a more dev DevOps approach, like Lika and the team, then the equivalent is running software. Uh, continue serving as many users as possible with minimal disruption. But you can also use, view Aviate as keeping your system evolvable and debuggable. So for example, how much effort is it to onboard a new team member, uh, add features or refactor? You know, this would likely be the approach for more pure development teams when defining what Aviate means for them. So for us, running software, minimal user impact. Mata asks, how many users are impacted? Average response times are still acceptable and the number of 500s is low. So first course of action, the team decide to make a copy of and then delete the expanding log file. This will keep the application running and buy them some time. RJ keeps a close eye on the dashboard and will alert the team if anything changes. On to navigate. One of the queues is still increasing a long way from the goal of near empty queues. One of the devs will volunteers to go through the copied log file. Meanwhile, Malcolm sets up a job to periodically delete the current log file from the problematic node. In the logs, Will notices that the application keeps throwing an exception. There's an error processing one of the messages and the listener just keeps retrying. And on every retry, it fails with the same exception. Now, this is a Java application, so what exception do we think it is? It's a null pointer exception. Java's billion dollar mistake. Anyway, Will continues to communicate his findings with the team and Marta writes them in the third column on the whiteboard. RJ yells out that the response times and the 500s are still good. Malcolm says that with the current log file being periodically deleted, sufficient disk space is being maintained. So at this point, the improvement plan is clear to the team. Find and fix the null pointer exception. Shut down all nodes of the application during a low use period. Wait for the queue to clear. Shovel the remaining messages to a temporary queue so that they can be inspected and restart the app. Implement a dead letter queue and reassess the retry policy. The last step, administrate, is to create tickets for the immediate fixes, add them to the sprint and inform the customer. Improvements such as the implementation of the dead letter queue can be added to the backlog and refined. So in this talk, we followed Leek and the team through a number of situations that you might encounter at, in your role as a software professional. And in each situation, they leveraged a concept well known in another profession. We saw RJ school Lika on opportunity costs when choosing between alternatives. Now, like it or not, there is an economic component to software development. We build things that are useful to others. And whether your customers are internal or external, there is an expectation that you provide the most value for a given amount of resources. Opportunity cost helps us compare the costs and benefits of alternatives and then choose accordingly. Consistently, consistency over perfection when looking to make improvements and form productive habits. By focus on your habits rather than only on the outcomes, you start to invest in the process and find joy in it. Take small steps and check in regularly to see how far your team has come. Agile already provides some tools for reflection, although a big favorite of mine are blameless and honest retrospectives. Putting relationships first to enhance learning and collaborations between teams. We can't claim to be a learning profession if there are no teachers. Put your relationships first and find ways to engage with and teach each other. We saw Marta apply the model Aviate, Navigate, Communicate, Administrate to deal with a production issue with the team. But the model is not just limited to production issues. You can also use it as a framework to plan the evolution of your application. And in the alternate reality, Lika and the team could have avoided some pain had they been aware of the human tendency to escalate a commitment 
once a significant investment of time and resources has been made. So back at the bar, the developer has just confirmed that yes, their office does have a ping pong table. The economist rolls his eyes and scoffs, see? But that's hardly a reason to claim I have the easiest job, protests the developer. Things are starting to get heated now, but just before it becomes an all-out brawl, someone walks in that shuts them all up. It's none other than Sir Patrick Stewart. And despite their differences, one thing the economist, teacher and developer all have in common is that they are mad Trekkies. And quickly, for those of you who don't know, Patrick Stewart is most well known for his role as Jean-Luc Picard in Star Trek, followed closely by being the bald guy in these memes. And so, astonished and with zero shame after a few beers, the developer asks Sir Patrick for some advice. So here are five things we could learn from Patrick Stewart in Patrick's own words. Be aware of your limitations, but don't take yourself too seriously. I don't do impersonations. I can do a wounded elephant, I can do a really good cow, and I do a variety of sheep, all of which I would be happy to roll out for you. Have an outlet. The only still centre of my life is Macbeth. To go back to doing this bloody, crazed, insane mass murderer is a huge relief after trying to get my cell phone replaced. <laughs> Keep your balance. It still frightens me to think a, a little... Sorry, it still frightens me a little bit to think that so much of my life was totally devoted to Star Trek and nothing else. The unconventional path might be the perfect path for you. One day, out of irritation, I said, you know, all of those years with the Royal Shakespeare Company was nothing but preparation for sitting in the captain's chair of the enterprise. And lastly, be fearless, be you. If someone says, give me one word of advice, I say, be fearless and knowing without any shadow of a doubt that what they have to give, who they are, is totally unique and not shared by anybody else and to believe in that uniqueness. My name is Adele and thanks so much for your time. <laughs>